Welcome back. Investigating the investigators on Sunday Morning Futures yesterday, I spoke with former House Oversight Committee Chairman Trey Gowdy about the dirty dossier and the 2016 email sent by then FBI Director Jim Comey. Watch this. Take me back to an email that Jim Comey wrote to his upper echelon staff. This is also considered classified, but you've seen it. Uh, what can you tell us about it? Well, take a half step back. I mean, people use the word dossier, and it has such an official sound to it. I mean, let, let's just call it for what it is. It's a series of rank hearsay, hearsay compilations put together by an FBI source who was later defrocked. What we're trying to figure out is whether or not it was used a fifth time in the intelligence assessment. And you got Brennan, Clapper, and Comey, all three who know full well whether or not it was used in the intelligence assessment, but they're giving you different, they're giving you different versions. Right. So uh, there is information that exists in December of 2016, and I hope anyone who has access to it, Senator Burr, Devin, wh whoever is open-minded, go look at that. And I think it will help you understand whether or not that dossier, yeah. that unverified hearsay, was used a, for five times or just four times by the United States government. It's pretty bad. So I'll explain this. Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano is here to walk us through it. Basically, what Trey Gowdy was saying was there was an email which was sent by Jim Comey to his leading upper echelon staff, including Baker and Peter Strzok and Andrew McCabe. And in that email, he writes to them, Brennan is insisting the crown material, being the dossier, be included in the intel assessment, Judge. That's different than what Brennan testified. Well, you know, there's obviously a, a conflict between what one said in an email, presumed it to be accurate because he's communicating to his staff, and what another said retroactively under oath. So it depends on how aggressive uh, U.S. Attorney uh, Durham in Connecticut, who's the person that the Attorney General of the United States, Bill Barr, has assigned to examine this. I use the word examine, examine and its form carefully and explain in a minute. It depends how deep he wants to go. Is he just going to write a report of who he thinks uh, uh, did behaved improperly and violated the law? Or is he going to use subpoena power and search warrants and grand juries and actually indict people? If he's going to do the former, we're just going to go back to uh, square one. And we will have all this bad stuff about people, but nobody will be prosecuted. If he's going to do the latter, that's what prosecutors do. They don't do, investi they don't do investigations to deliver reports. They do investigations to deliver indictments. Yeah. And if they don't have enough evidence to indict, then they leave you alone. But the, the reason that this is important is because this is fingering John Brennan. And Brennan has been running around the last last two years saying that President Trump committed treason. And in fact, if this email is correct, it is basically saying that it was Brennan who said use the dossier in the intel assessment. And the intel assessment, of course, is the assessment that Russia colluded with, I'm sorry, that Russia meddled in the U.S. election. Well, if the, Nothing to do with Trump. Right. It's that Russia meddled. I haven't seen the email, obviously, but if the email is correct, it directly contradicts what Brennan said under oath. Exactly. Which is another thing for the folks in Connecticut uh, to examine, whether or not the former director of the CIA perjured himself in order to make himself uh, look good. Yeah, and, and go ahead, Tom. Judge, I mean, you know William Barr. Um, and you've seen his statements on this, and he just did an interview with Bill Hemmer talking about it. He seems like he's going to sort of go back and, and get to the bottom of this. A lot of those folks who were at the FBI and the Justice Department, they're, they're all gone now. They're, they've left. Not right. um, Well, most of them have. Well, the, the, names, the names we know are gone. That's My point is, a lot of people think, involved. The bad think, apples are gone. That I agree with. Do you think that William Barr is going to proceed with an investigation with subpoenas, with indictments, or do you think this will just be a, a report that, you know, comes and goes? I wish I had the confidence that you do and that Maria does that this will be a serious federal criminal investigation. But I know the way law enforcement likes to protect its own. I know the way the team in Connecticut, when they investigated CIA abuse, whitewashed the abuse, and it was there. Diane Feinstein revealed it on the floor of the uh, on the floor of the Senate. So I don't know where it's going to go. If the New York Times is correct 
and this is a report and not a criminal New York Times investigation. Is not the only, only it's a organization that's reported that. Kimberly Strass on the Wall Street Journal reported that on Friday that it's a review and that right now Durham does not have subpoena power. So or if is he it does not have injury. subpoena power, he's not going to get the first base. You can only conduct an investigation of this magnitude where the people you're investigating are present and former law enforcement officials who know how the system works. You're not going to get the first base without subpoena power and without a grand jury because well, a grand jury not, indicts. But can't a review turn into an investigation? Like, yeah, yeah, but uh, why waste the time with the review? Just do the right thing. Well, let's not forget that the Congress, the House Oversight Committee, the House Intel Committee, the House Judiciary Committee has done a lot of this work and has had testimony, and some of it's classified already, that they're basically handing over on a silver platter to Bill Barr. Right. And there's more. All of these informants that were going in, Trey Gowdy also talked to me about releasing transcripts related to the investigation uh, from the FISA courts because we heard from George Papadopoulos on this program where he told us about the informants that came at him. Right. Those informant conversations should be transcribed. Watch this. When an FBI agent sends in informants to someone they're looking at, typically those conversations are recorded, right? Those people are wired. Yeah, I mean, if the Bureau is going to send an informant in, the informant's going to be wired. And if the Bureau is monitoring telephone calls, there's going to be a transcript of that. Um, and some of us have been fortunate enough to know whether or not those transcripts exist, but they haven't been made public. And I think one in particular is going, it has the potential to actually persuade people. Very little on this Russia probe, I'm afraid, is going to persuade people who hate Trump or who love Trump. But there is some information in these transcripts that I think has the potential to be a game changer. Well, he is correct. That whenever there's a wire, there is a transcript. The question is, does the transcript see the light of day? What I think he also is concerned about is why this wasn't presented to the FISA court. And I've been saying this for a long time. Tom and I have talked about this on Brett Baer's show. FISA has corrupted FBI agents, soft form of corruption. If you go to a, a regular judge, as I was, and make an application for a uh, search warrant, present probable cause of crime, and you get the search warrant, and you find evidence of crime, and you prosecute the person, the application you made to the federal judge is revealed to defense counsel, and they can cross-examine the FBI agent. Why didn't you tell this to the judge? Why didn't you tell that to the judge? When you go to a FISA judge and make an application for a search warrant with its lower standard, not probable cause of crime, but probable cause of speaking to a foreign person, call a hotel in Milan to make a reservation, you qualify for a search warrant under FISA. That information is never shown to defense counsel. And the FBI knows that. So we may, for the first time in history, in the 41-year history of FISA, see how it works and see how one-sided it is because this court issues 99.97% of all requested search warrants. There isn't a court in the well, country that does that. Which is why this is so maddening. Yes. Because Peter Strzok and his uh, buddies over there at the top of the FBI misled the FISA court. Absolutely. And did not tell the FISA court that this dirty dossier, which was unsolicited, which was unverified and salacious, was actually paid for by the, the, the subject of the, of the report's political enemy, enemy, Hillary Clinton. And the reason they were able to do that is for what I just articulated. They knew with certainty that FISA records are never revealed, even if they result in so criminal prosecution. So I don't, I don't blame FISA. I blame Peter Strzok for, for, and, and the people who, you know, took or advantage of FISA. I understand Tommy what you're saying about FISA. FISA. Has, FISA has let them do this, and yeah. FISA has been, has been just become an arm of these people. No, to, Jim Comey let him these do it. People. Jim Comey let him do it. Jim Comey even looked Brett Baer in the eye last spring and said, I don't know with certainty that the DNC and the Clinton campaign paid for that dossier. If you're running the FBI and getting a warrant on a member of a presidential campaign, you don't know that the information you're using but to you get know, that these, warrant I was agree. paid well, for either by his he opponent? was lying then to Brett or... He was a completely ineffective FBI director. I think he knew everything that was think, going on. I think he and was, he lied to Brett I think he was very effective. <laughs> Come on. Judge, great to see you. Oh, Thank pleasure, you so guys. Judge Tom, Tom, all the best. There.